Namaskar everybody and welcome to the Gita Satsang for today. So let us start with the Prarthana. By the Guru's grace and the will of Shri Krishna, we have all assembled for this Gita Satsang. May we have their guidance to be able to learn and adopt the things which will help us to grow spiritually. Let us chant the shlokas. Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardhanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum Krishna Yavasudevaya Haraye Paramatmane Pranataklesha Nashaya Govindaya Namo Namaha Namostu te vyasa vishala buddhe, Ullara vindayata patranetra, Yenatvaya bharata taila purnaha, Rajva lito gnana maya pradipaha. Rama nujataya patram gnana vairagya bhushanam, Srimad venkatanatharyam vande vedanta deshikam, Yonitya machuta padam buja yukma rukma, Vyamo hatas taditarani trinayamene, Asmad guru or bagavatos yadayaka sindo, Rama anujas yacharana usharanam prapadye. So, with prayers at the lotus feet of the acharyas, let us start our satsang for today. So, we have seen up to the 61st shloka in the previous satsang. So today we will take up shloka 62 and 63. The reason for taking these two together is because they are very much closely related to each other and together they present something like, you know, a flow chart or um, definite uh, stage-wise explanation of what happens one after the other. So, Lord Krishna is talking to Arjuna and he has been explaining to him about how it is difficult to control the senses and why it is important to focus the senses on the Lord. So now he continues in 62nd shloka and 63rd shloka. He says, Dhyayato vishayan pumsaha sangaste shupajayate sangat sanjayate kamaha kamat krodho bijayate Krodat Bhavati Sammohaha, Sammohat Smriti Vibhramaha, Smriti Bhramshat Buddhinashaha, Buddhinashat Pranashyati. So he is explaining that when someone does dhyana, when somebody thinks about or puts their attention to Vishaya, to the objects, which objects, the objects which are coming in contact with our senses. So, when somebody contemplates on the subjects of the senses, that person develops attachment to them. Once the attachment comes, it leads to desire. And from that desire comes anger. Next, what happens? Because of the anger, the judgment is clouded. Anger leads to clouding of judgment which results in bewilderment of memory, which is like a loss of memory. And when the memory is bewildered, when the memory is confused, when the memory is lost, the intellect, the buddhi gets destroyed. And once the buddhi is destroyed, then that person is completely ruined. So here, Krishna is laying out a definite um, order of events that will happen if somebody is too much attached to the objects which occupy the senses. So, the ladder, like he is building up, what all is going to happen? So, here, these shlokas are warning us that if we do not engage our senses in the Lord, then what is the danger that is going to come? So, we must understand this very carefully so that we can avoid this danger. So, how is this uh, working in actual life. When our senses go here and there, when they stray and they get attached to some object, there is a small flame 
of desire which wakens within us. Now, after some time, if we keep engaging our mind and keep attaching our senses to that particular object, that desire, which was some, which was nothing but a small flame, it starts becoming stronger and stronger and it becomes a blazing fire. Now, that means that the desire to attain that object, to acquire that object, to enjoy that object has become very, very, very strong. And if, let us say, there are two options now. So, the desire has developed. Now, if that desire is fulfilled, there is one flow of events. And if desire is not fulfilled, there is another flow of events. So, here Krishna is talking about what happens if the desire is not fulfilled. But let us just pause here and understand that suppose let us say I have uh, got, I have uh, acquired some desire for some particular object and that desire has become strong. And suppose let us say I get that object and I'm able to fulfill that desire. Now what is going to happen? Does it mean that just because the desire was fulfilled that it is going to go away? No. Once I have enjoyed that particular object, then it is going to make me more and more attached to that object itself. So I will want to have more and more of that enjoyment time and again. Isn't it? This is what happens to people when they are addicted to something, right? Whether it is uh, smoking and alcohol or pornography or um, nowadays people are all addicted youngsters to their mobile phones. So what is it that you have a desire for something? You give in to that desire. You enjoy that. And then what happens? It takes over. It takes hold of you. And you want to enjoy it more and more. So by thinking that, okay, today I will have, I will enjoy this. Then tomorrow the desire will go away. That will never happen. The more we try to satisfy our desires, the more they will come back again and again, stronger and stronger to torment us. It is like saying, if there is a fire which is burning, right? And I want to put out the fire, then... If I just go on adding more oil or ghee into that fire, it will burn more and more because I am providing fuel to that fire. But if I want to put out that fire, then I have to do something which will cut off the oxygen supply. Something which is not going to fuel the fire has to be thrown into the fire. I have to pour water in it or I have to cover it with a blanket so that oxygen doesn't reach the fire. And then it will stop blazing. So giving in to a desire is never going to be the way to get rid of that desire. Let us say there is some particular uh, food that I like. Now, every time I eat that food, that desire goes stronger and stronger. So I want to eat more and more of it. But if for some days I decide that I'm going to control the urge to eat that desire and after a sufficient amount of time has passed, once the desire for that food dies away in me, then even if it is there in abundance in front of me, I will not be tempted to eat that. Right? So, this is what happens. Now, suppose somebody has their senses attached to some object. Then there is a flame, a tiny flame of desire which starts. Then that flame becomes a blazing fire. And if you acquire that object and you start enjoying it, it is not that the desire will die away. It will keep becoming stronger and stronger. And it will start occupying more and more of your mental space. And it will start taking up more and more of your energy and your time in this world. Right. Now, on the other hand, if the desire is not attained, what happens? This is what Krishna is explaining in these slokas. So suppose I desire something and I don't get that. Immediately, the response that comes from my mind is anger. Anger against what? Against anyone or anything which prevented me from getting that desire. We've all seen how our children act, no? Like suppose there is a toy and the kid is going on playing with the toy and it's time for the kid to go somewhere or do something or to go to sleep and you pull the toy away. What happens? The kid fights back in anger. The kid will start crying. The kid will start crying, right? That is a kid. But what about us? We think we are adults and emotionally mature. But what do we do? We also have the same response that if there is something that I want very badly and there is someone who is becoming an obstruction in me attaining that, what happens? I start getting angry with that person. I pour all my venom on that person, right? And not only that person, but also against anybody, anything which is related to that person. That also comes in the, you know, firing line from my side. To explain how pervasive this anger is, uh, the Acharyas give an example. It is mentioned in the Valmiki Ramayana that when Rama was 
um, like when he came to know that Sita has been kidnapped and he comes to know that it is Ravana who has kidnapped Sita, then his anger is so great that now what is a um, thing that has happened here? Ravana, sorry, Rama has attachment for Sita and because Sita has been taken away and he is not able to be with her, so the anger has developed, right? That desire was not attained. So anger has developed. And now because of that, Rama says, I will destroy all the Rakshasas. I will destroy anybody who stands in my path, but I will definitely get back Sita. Now, of course, the basic concept of kidnapping Sita was wrong. And so Rama was correct in wanting to get her back. That We are not discussing that part here. But I hope you understand the... Um, reason why this example is being given that even somebody like Rama in when he took human form he was not uh, out of the purview of this kind of an action that when there is some object of desire and that desire is thwarted that desire cannot be fulfilled then the person gets angry against whoever is an obstacle in attaining that desire so Rama was angry not only on Ravana he said I will destroy all the Rakshasas all the Rakshasas have not kidnapped Sita. But because all the Rakshasas are related to Ravana and anybody who stands in my path, I will destroy them all, but I will get back Sita. So nature of anger is like that. It is pervasive. So it will take everything and it will destroy everything which comes in the path. Right. So what we have seen here is when the senses get attached to an object, a small frame of desire comes. That desire becomes a blazing fire. If that desire is attained, does not mean that the desire will be fulfilled and it will die away, but it will keep continuing to torment us. And suppose we don't get what we desire, then the next stage that comes is anger. Anger against whoever or whatever has come in the way of our attaining that particular desire. Now next what happens? Once anger comes into the picture, now we already know from our own experience, isn't it, that the minute we get angry, we all have this problem that when everything is fine and going well and everything is calm and everybody is good to us and we are good to everybody, we are the best of people in this world. But the minute somebody does something to make us angry, then we don't realize what we are talking. We don't realize what we are saying. We don't realize what we are thinking. We don't realize how we hurt people with our words. And why is that, does that happen? Because our mind gets deluded. The anger leads to delusion. What is this delusion? It is the inability to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. So this viveka is lost. The discrimination power goes away. So anger causes our mind to get deluded. And the minute that happens, then it leads to loss of memory. What memory is this for us? What does it mean, this loss of memory? Now, why have we started this entire journey? Why are we studying Bhagavad Gita? Why are we doing sadhana? It is so that we can become more sattvic, so that we can subdue our senses, so that we can turn our senses towards the more positive path, so that we can make the Lord the object of our journey, so that we can attain Him. That is the purpose why we have started this journey. Now, but when we get angry, then we get deluded. Our mind stops thinking, stops uh, discriminating between right and wrong. So the minute that thing happens, then this memory that why did I start this journey? That idea itself is lost. And the minute I lose track of that, the minute I lose sight of what is my goal, my buddhi is destroyed. And the minute the buddhi is destroyed, there is loss of whatever knowledge I have of the Atma Swarupa. So when I am in satsang, when I am doing sadhana, when I am uh, in a good frame of mind, I try to remind myself that Atma is different, body is different. If somebody says something rude to me, if I am not able to get that which I wanted to get, if things don't go as per my desire, then it is okay because it is only related to the body. My Atma is untouched by all this. I can tell myself in good times. But the minute something happens and anger comes into the picture, then I lose all this because my mind gets deluded. I can't differentiate what is right and what is wrong. And in that rage, in that anger, I completely forget all these other things. 
Why does that happen? Because the samskaras in our mind are very strong and it will take a lot of more time for us to overcome that, um, what you say, negative effect of the anger. So the minute we lose this knowledge of what is this Atma, what is my actual Swarupa, I am actually the Atma and not the Sharira. If I lose that knowledge, then I will keep struggling in this cycle of birth and death. So, here we must remember this chain of events. So, that is what Krishna is trying to impress upon Arjuna, that how dangerous it is. Your senses stray, they get attached to object. The minute you get attached to object, you keep thinking more and more about it. You contemplate on it. When you contemplate more and more, what was a small thought in your mind becomes a blazing desire. If you get that desire also, you are not going to be happy. You will only want more and more of it. If you don't get the desire, you will start getting angry because there is an obstacle in attaining the desire. Your anger will be not only against the person who stopped you, but also against everything related to him or her. And then with that anger, your mind will get deluded. Then you lose the ability to focus and decide what is right and wrong. Then your memory is lost. You forget why you started this journey. You forget what is the purpose of your life. You forget why you are doing all this sadhana. Your buddhi is destroyed. And then you lose track of the idea that I am the Atma and not this Sharira. And once that happens, you are only going to get caught up and stay struggling in this constant cycle of Janma Mrityu. So that is what we have to avoid. So that is why Krishna has been talking about all this. Arjuna wanted to know who is a Muni, who is a Sita Pragna. So Krishna explained to him. And then he's gone further to make a very clear a connection to something that Arjuna will understand. Now for us also, if we just try to recollect any incident where we have got really very angry, we've, we will definitely understand that never any good comes out of anger. We may think that if somebody is doing wrong, then I have to correct them, isn't it? But even in that kind of a situation, you will be able to achieve much more by being calm and trying to point out in a quiet manner what exactly is wrong rather than flying off the handle and, you know, getting into a rage. We've seen so many times, like take the example of people fighting on the road, road rage. What happens? Somebody is driving. Another person tries to cut across. Now this person, what was his desire? He wanted to be there in front. So when he wanted to reach fast or he wanted to go at a particular speed, he had to get there in a hurry. So that was his desire. Now somebody came in the way of it. So what happened now? He gets angry. He gets angry on that person who came and cut him off. So the minute he gets angry, now there is a clash which has happened. There may be a tiny scratch or whatever. He gets down. Both of them get down. They start fighting. right? And in that anger, they say a lot of nasty things to each other. They may get so angry that they will hold each other's collars and get to actual physical blows. They may start fighting with each other, isn't it? And then once they get so angry, it is so difficult for other people to come and pull them apart. We have read of incidents in the newspapers. We keep reading how somebody got angry and um, killed the spouse. Somebody else got angry and committed murder, right? Somebody got angry and they committed suicide. Or somebody got angry and they just uh, did something which they would never have done if they had been in the right frame of mind, right? We've even heard of cases where if the child was making a lot of noise and very much disturbing the mother and the mother would have thrown that child from some floor of the building and the baby would have died. We've heard all such things. So what are all these examples? They are an extreme example of what happens when some desire is not fulfilled. So in the future shlokas, Krishna is going to tell about how he has already told that instead of attaching your senses to the object, you bring them towards me. And this is the reason why. Because he is trying to tell us that if you don't engage your senses in the Lord, if you don't engage the senses in something which will lead you forward towards Satvikata, then these are the dangers which are going to come on you. So Instead of letting your senses go here and there, attach them to the Lord. 
Now, here I just want to mention one uh, story. I think many of you would have heard of it or read of it. There was a king called Yayati. And that Yayati Raja, he came actually in the Ikshvaku Vamsha. And later from his children only, the Yadava Vamsha and the Kaurava Vamsha also came. Now, this story of Yayati is a very big story and there are a lot of lessons we can learn from it, of course. Let us see, maybe some other time we can take up the entire story. But for now, I will just narrate one small part of that story. So what happens is, this Yayati, now he is uh, he has four sons. The oldest son is Yadu and the youngest son is Puru. So by right, the eldest son only will rule after the father, isn't it? So, it should have been Yadu who got the kingdom. Now, what happens is this Yayati, he's lived a good, nice life and he's enjoyed everything and all. But still, when he gets a little old, he has not lost his desire to enjoy. Now, there are some version of this story which say that he was cursed by his wife's father, by Shukracharya. That part we will not get into anyway, whatever be the reason. But this king, this Yayati, got a desire that he should live more. Why? Because he felt he had not enjoyed enough. He wanted to enjoy some more. So he did what is unthinkable. Normally we see that whenever parents are there and children are there, the parents are willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the child. Isn't it? Many times, suppose there is some dish you have cooked at home and there is little less which is left over. Everybody else has eaten. You have to still eat. And your child comes asking for some more. You will willingly give it to the child. Isn't it? Very rarely you will find that we feel like saying that, no, no, I have to eat. You don't, I can't give you. The mother will willingly give it to the child or the parents have that natural attitude of sacrificing for the sake of the child. Now, this Yayati had so much desire, so much karma in him that he asked his children that I want some of your Ayus. Give me a little of your Ayusha. Give me some of your lifetime. I want to enjoy some more. So it will be like the children are young. You, he wants to trade their youth for his old age. And he goes asking like that. So he asks the first son. Yadu outright refuses. He says, no way. I'm not going to part with my youth. I can't take your old age. I will not do that. The other two children also refuse. The last son, who is Puru, he says, after all, you are my father. It's okay. You want to enjoy? Fine. So he gives thousand years of his youth to Yayati and Yayati's old age comes to that Puru. So this Yayati, when that Yadu refuses to give him to exchange his youth, he gets so angry that he curses him. He says, you are my eldest born son. You should have been willing to do whatever I told because I'm your father, but you are refusing to uh, do this for me. So I curse you that you will not get the Yuvaraj Patta. You will not, never become a ruler. And because Puru agreed to his wish and Puru gave him his youth, he said that Puru only from now on will be the king. And whoever comes in the Vamsha of Yadu will not be rulers. And whoever comes in the Vamsha of Puru, they will be the rulers. So it happened that like this, as their Vamshas went ahead and ahead, the Puru Vamsha, that in that Vamsha only, the Kauravas came into the picture, right? Whether you, the, we, you can say start like uh, Puru and then many other kings after him and then Puru and then after that, the Shantanu. And from Shantanu, then the remaining lineage continued, isn't it? So the Pandava, the Pandu and Dhritarashtra and all of them. So of course, like that, it came into the picture and they were the rulers. Now, Yadu, that Yadu's Kula, they lost the right to rule. And it is told that that is the reason why Krishna took Janma in the Yadu Kula. The Yad Yadavas, the Yadus, they, the descendants of that Yadu, they were kind of, you know, they had lost face. They had lost their glory because of this curse of Yayati. And that is why Krishna took Janma in that Yadukula to restore the glory, to bring back a good name to the Yadavakula. Uh, now, one more thing about that thing is, okay, this Yayati took away the uh, youth of uh, Puru and he enjoyed, now he enjoyed for thousand years with that youth. Okay, he enjoyed in all sense pleasures. And suddenly one day it struck him that, what is this I have done? Thousand years I have enjoyed. And still that desire is not going away. 
my desires have not lessened they are only at the same level they are increasing more and more and he comes to his senses so then he comes back and he gives the youth back to your puru and says take your youth back i have understood i have realized that these desires all this kama sukha all the desire for worldly pleasures will not ever get uh, you know satisfied so that is what we should understand that any desire is there you given and given and given to that desire it will never get fulfilled it will never die down so we cannot do anything to kill that desire if we keep fulfilling that desire but if we learn to hold back our senses if we learn not to indulge in that desire then only it will go away and we can hope to conquer that desire now, along with that of course there is also this thing that we need to have the grace of the lord and that is what will take away this uh, desire from us actually speaking so it, the god's grace has to be on us <clears throat> so here because we have time i will tell this story of uh, somebody called vipra narayana he is actually known as tondaradi podi alvar he is one of the alvars uh, maybe when we do the navratri satsang we will come to his story again anyway for now because it is relevant here i will just narrate in brief uh, so this person called vipra narayana he was a brahmin by birth and he was living in the precincts of the ranganatha temple and he had lot of devotion for lord ranganatha and he used to offer he had heard about all great devotees who had done you know pushpa kainkarya to the lord so they would grow flowers in the garden and they would offer make malas of those flowers and offer it to the lord and that was their seva to the lord so he decided that he also wants to do that so in the locality of the temple he had uh, you know tended and grown a very beautiful garden with variety of flowers lot of tulsi plants and all that and every day his seva was he would do um he would collect all those flowers and uh, things and in the process of that he would uh, be um doing seva so he, all the time his mind was only focused on the lord all the time he was only chanting the names of lord ranganatha and he was doing this seva with lot of bhava with lot of bhakti to the lord now what happened is um he was doing all that but somewhere the lord wanted to uh, teach him a lesson of of increasing his bhakti or the lord wanted to show him that how the desires can sway somebody so what happened is that one day there was one a uh, lady one dancing girl a prostitute you can say who passed by that area and she and her friend were passing by and they both saw this vipranarayana and she said oh see this man this lady had a lot of pride in her beauty and she knew she said that there is no man in this world who can uh, resist me after looking at me once they will be tempted to have a relation with me so she was very proud of that so she told her friend see i will make that man that friend said no no he is a great bhakta of the lord he will not fall for you and all that she said no 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 i am going to definitely make him uh, come under my sway so what she did is she pretended she took a she took on the guise of a bhakta herself she wore all you know clothes like somebody who is a great devotee of the lord and um, she came and she start she said i will i will help you in the garden i am i am also interested in doing seva to the lord so she came and started doing that now he used to still ignore her and all that but then one day what happened was it was suddenly raining and she got wet in the rain and she came to his hut in that garden and she said please give me some place to stay and all that i am uh, getting wet in the rain and all so he agreed he said okay you can sit on that jagli there so she came and then one thing led to the other and you know how it is right so then what happened is he was very much uh suddenly he felt some kind of a desire for her and then he got so lost in that desire that they started living together and he wanted to have more and more pleasure with her now after some time this girl now when she has acquired she has um, what you say met that challenge isn't it her challenge was i will make him succumb to me to my um, beauty now she has achieved that goal of hers so she says uh, after one or two day after some some time she says Go, the, my goal is met and she goes away from that place she goes back to her home place 
then this man this vipranarayana is so this thing that he so crazed with desire for her that he goes there searching for her and then when he goes there that girl's mother says who are you why have you come so she says no like this and all he explains so she says no no i can't people who come to meet my who, who come to uh, my daughter they come to spend time with my daughter they have to bring some money or something gifts for her then only i will allow them so what have you brought so he says no i am a poor brahmana i have nothing i am only serving in the temple no without that i can't let you so then what happens he goes back and he is upset and still but he is not realized you know that this desire has taken him in the wrong direction he is still lost in that only and he is uh, quietly lying in his house and he is in great depression because he can't meet her and all that now in the meantime now the lord has decided okay i have i want to teach this fellow a complete lesson so what the lord does is the next day somebody comes to this um, girl dancing girl's house with one golden bowl and they say that um, this vipranarayana has sent this bowl and he said that he wants to meet you so that mother is very happy she says yeah 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 ask him to come and all that by the time this happens in the evening the next day morning when they open lord ranganatha's sannidhi they find that the golden bowl which is used to serve food to the lord to serve prasada to the lord is missing and there's a hue and cry all over that the lord's bowl has gone missing now one servant who was working in that dancing girl's house she reports that i saw it there so they go the raja sends all his uh, soldiers and they go there and question and then it comes to be known that it was vipranarayana who sent that bowl to that girl, dancing girl so they catch hold of vipranarayana and throw him in the jail and there when he is fallen in that jail suddenly he has a realization he says what is this what happened to me what was i doing i was lost in contemplation on lord but then i gave in to my senses i got carried away with my senses and i wanted to indulge in some pleasure and see where it has brought me now i am thrown in this jail like this and he prays and prays to lord ranganatha and he says uh, thank you for opening my eyes now i have realized now you do whatever you want with me but never again will i go this path of wrongful desires never again will i stray from you and he lies in that jail keeping on chanting the lord's name singing uh, songs in praise of the lord and so on and then the lord decides that okay now enough 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 so he comes to the king in a dream and he explains that this is all what has happened and then vipranarayana is released from the jail and once vipranarayana is released from the jail then he goes back to the temple and he has now come to the stage where he is totally focused only on the lord and he has no any absolute other desire in fact this vipranarayana becomes such a great devotee that he realizes that forget about serving the lord the lord is somewhere very far away and what i do for the lord i can never do it uh, physically to my fulfillment but there are so many people who are devotees of the lord and if i serve those devotees then maybe by their blessings the lord's grace will continue to be on me because in the bhagavad gita also we will see in some future chapter the lord has said that i am more uh, what you say i give a lot of grace i am more happy by someone who serves my devotee rather than someone who serves me directly so this vipranarayana he gets very much engaged with service to the devotees of the lord and in fact that is why he gets the name he, he in sanskrit they call him bhaktangri renu so bhaktangri renu means somebody who worships the dust of the feet of the devotees and in tamil he is called tondar adi podi tondar means somebody who is a devotee of the lord adi means their feet and podi means the dust of their feet so somebody who worships the dust of the feet of the devotee of the lord such a kind of person this vipranarayana becomes so from this story we can understand that how if there is desire it will only lead us on the wrong path and therefore the answer is not in giving in to the desire but in subduing that desire now because it is very difficult for us to subdue our desire our mind is like a monkey which keeps jumping here and there so it will definitely not let go of the desire so what you do all your senses which are pulling you in the wrong direction towards attaining the wrong things by giving you wrong desires you pull all those senses and engage them in service of the lord engage your senses in thinking of the lord 
in talking about him, in hearing about him, in doing seva towards him. And when that happens, then the Lord himself will take care to make sure that you come towards him. So this is what we need to understand. And we must remember this whenever we have any kind of a desire awakening within us, and whenever we are tempted to get angry, whenever we find, okay, we are still conditioned to get very angry. So we may not realize it immediately. But uh, even after I have got angry, if I can understand that what is this, what I did? What is this that I have uh, given into? And next time I will be more alert. So let us try and remember this and let us pray to God that he should bless us to put all this into practice. So we must try and stay alert any kind of an unholy desire that wakens in our mind, fight against that. Make a, uh, you know, effort to do some tyaga. We have certain habits. We know they are not good habits or we know that particular mode of action is not correct. Then effortfully try to do tyaga of that. Give up that. Subdue that. And all the time along with that, focus our senses on the Lord. When we combine both these things, then definitely the Lord will bless us and we will be able to do and engage ourselves more and more in sadhana. Then we will find that our mind is going on the path of sadhana. It is going towards God and taking us further in our spiritual practice and not dragging us and pulling us downhill. So let us pray that Krishna only has to bless us. The Lord has to bless us to be able to do all these things. And definitely his grace will be on us. So we've reached the end of our time. So let us offer Krithagnata gratitude at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna and Guru for inspiring us to start and join this satsang. And let us pray for their blessings and grace to always be on us. Thank you everybody for attending the satsang. And we will meet again next Thursday. <laughs>